behalf of TEPS, I would uh, like to welcome you to this uh, Zoom debate on EU-Swiss relations and on EU or Euro skepticism. Uh, I can see that we already have like quite a, a good number of participants here. Um, it seems to be a, a good turnout and um, I think, um, you know, at least I have to say for myself, I'm, uh, I've been uh, uh, looking forward to this debate because it also gives us a little bit of a break of this uh, uh, corona crisis and uh, you know uh, a lot of it a lot of uh, you know what we've been dealing with over the past uh, uh, weeks and months have been overshadowed by the corona crisis so today we're gonna take sort of a mental break from that uh, from this pandemic uh, and talk about EU Swiss relations even though of course the coronavirus has also consequences for these EU Swiss relations uh, my name is Niklaus Nussbiger. I'm uh, the political correspondent for Neue Türcher Zeitung, the Swiss daily uh, based in London. Uh, until last October, I was uh, based in Brussels as the correspondent or political correspondent for European affairs. And I've uh, I followed there in Brussels the ups and downs of EU-Swiss relations for uh, six years. And now, of course, also out of London, I'm continuing uh, to follow uh, Swiss-EU relations because, uh, and we might probably talk about that too in the debate, the Brexit negotiations or these post-Brexit trade negotiations between the EU and the UK government have an influence on Swiss-EU relations and Swiss-EU relations have an influence on the Brexit debate. So I would like to thank the Trans-European Policy Studies Associations for organizing this debate, for inviting me to moderate it. Um, and um, we will today in this debate try to analyze, um, you know, the drivers of EU skepticism in Switzerland. Is Switzerland a special case or not? We will also try to analyze the current deadlock uh, in Swiss EU relations, and then we will try to see if we can uh, unlock this uh, relationship in a post-COVID setting. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, our four panelists to this debate. Um, first of all, Christa Markwalder. Uh, she is a Swiss politician, former president of the National Council, the big chamber in the Swiss parliament, currently a member of the National Council for the Liberal Party FDP. Uh, and she is probably one of the Swiss members of parliament with the highest profile in foreign affairs, and she has worked uh, on EU Swiss relations for many years. Welcome, Christa. Thank you, Niklaus. Hello. Um, then I would like to welcome uh, Professor Frank Schimmelfenig, who is a professor of European uh, politics at ETH Zurich. His uh, research focuses on the theory and development of European integration. His research projects have examined, for example, EU enlargement, uh, differentiated integration, or EU democracy uh, promotion. And he's also a member of the TEPSA board. Uh, welcome, Professor Schimmelfenig. You can quickly say hi. <laughs> you have to turn on the microphone, though. <laughs> yes, I've, I've seen that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for organizing this. Yeah. <laughs> then I would like to welcome uh, Stefan Walter, uh, who is a professor of international relations and political economy at the Department of Political Science at the University of Zurich. And she's also the director of the Center for Comparative and International Studies, which is a joint venture, so to speak, of ETH and Uni Zurich. Her research uh, focuses on international political economy, economic policy, and globalization more largely. Welcome, uh, Professor Walter. Welcome, hello. And last but not least, uh, I would like to welcome Paul Schmidt who is uh, the Secretary General of the Austrian Society for European Politics, based in Vienna. He has worked at the Österreichische Nationalbank in Vienna and also at the permanent representation of Austria to the European Union in Brussels. Uh, he's one of the editors of the book series, Euroskepticism and the Future of Europe's Views from the Capitals. Uh, welcome, good to have you here, Paul. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. So, um, as uh, uh, so, we will have a short pass on to the uh, 
uh, introductory remarks of our four uh, panelists. They will have around seven minutes uh, for these remarks. We will have a moment of debate uh, between the five of us. And you, uh, dear audience, you will have a possibility uh, to participate in this debate. You, can, you have two possibilities to ask a question, either uh, by writing, there's these uh, question and answer sections um, in the Zoom uh, uh, software, uh, but you can also raise your hand and then uh, we will try to bring you into the debate uh, live, uh, which will make the debate obviously even a bit more livelier. Before that, uh, before we start with the introductory remarks, I would maybe uh, quickly turn um, to Paul, um, because as many of you might know, you know, this um, discussion also takes place in the framework of the book presentation, uh, Euroscepticism and the Future of Europe Views from the Capital, and Paul Schmidt is uh, one of the three editors. So maybe, Paul, very briefly, can you tell us uh, you know, what is this book about? Uh, what is the main concept behind the book? And maybe also when and where will it be able, uh, will it be possible to purchase it? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Niklas. Um, it, it's good to start this, this discussion on Swiss-EU relations and I feel a little bit, uh, as an outsider, I'm here in Vienna and I just observe from the outside how these relations actually evolve, but I'm happy to, to comment a little bit on the situation as I see it. On the book, maybe, um, you've mentioned, Niklas, what TAPSA is, the Trans-European Policy Studies Association. And within TAPSA, TAPSA has many, many members and is a very decentralized organization. So our idea was actually to use all those expertise and knowledge which we have in EU capitals and in EU countries and in European countries beyond the EU, use this know-how and bring it all together. And the result of, of this uh, idea is um, the book, uh, which is called, as you have said before, it's called Euroscepticism and the Future of Europe, Views from the Capital. So we collect the views from the capital, from Iceland to uh, the Ukraine, from Turkey to Spain, from Norway to Switzerland to Greece and, and beyond, including uh, the countries of the Western Balkans. So we have 39 contributions. And these contributions are short and concise and easy to read op-ed style articles. So each each of our analysts from the country actually writes about how the political landscape in this uh, respective country evolves and develops and how your skepticism, how strong is your skepticism within the party system. And maybe it is not that strong, but how much does it actually influence the political agenda? Because we know that with this, um, impact of your skepticism on a national basis, um, it, it, it has its impact on, on the European priorities of the country, and then it, it, it feeds into the European agenda and the European politics of the country. And, and this is what the European integration is actually built on. So we look into the decentralized features of the different national political spheres, so to speak. And it is a sort of, the book will be a sort of a guide through the European political landscape, I would say. So you can actually pick and choose, take out the chapter of Switzerland, which was written by, by Frank, and look what the situation is in Switzerland. What are the different parties? What are the topics? What are the priorities? And how does it actually feed into the, the Swiss European um, political priorities, which are defined on a national basis. And then it actually sums up, um, it shows the diversity of, of the European Union and the European political continent. And it shows you the, 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 the different, the things that countries have in common, the different patterns, which are similar from one Euroskeptic situation to the next. But it also, shows many, it also shows many differences because it is a different situation if we, if we talk about a country, let's say, um, 
size matters, okay? So it's different if you talk about Austria or if you talk about Spain. History matters, geography matters, but also your degree of involvement in European integration matters. Are you part of the 19 countries which have the euro as the common currency? Are you part of the European Union? Are you outside of the European Union? Are you part of the European economic area? Their euro skepticism is defined in a completely different way. Look at Ireland, for example, at Finland, for example, then you have countries like Denmark, uh, where the writer talks about um, the pushback, pushback of euro skepticism uh, in the late, latest elections to the European Parliament and um, the, the impact this has on, on the, the Danish priorities. Or you have countries like the Netherlands, which uh, reflect upon what does the Brexit actually mean for their political landscape and their uh, European political agenda. So it's a, yes, in, in the end, it's a, it's a nice, very nice and handy um, guide through the political landscape of Europe. You don't have to read the whole book but you can actually pick and choose whatever, whatever country you're interested in, and you will find features which they have in common and features which are very individual. And the book is actually, um, will be published by uh, Palgraf Macmillan, and it will be out there at, uh, in June, beginning of June, electronically, and we hope to have it in our hands um, by the end of June, beginning of July, and the issue is that we ask all the authors to bring in the, this, to use the book as a tool, as an instrument, to uh, motivate a discussion on Euroscepticism and the future of Europe in their political national public sphere, be it in Spain, Iceland, wherever they are. You can do it transnationally the way we do it now in English, or you can say, okay, I will do that in German before the German EU Council presidency starts, and we will do it for a German audience, or we will do both. So there will be lots of debates out there, 39 debates, and a lot of presentations out there. And the main goal is, in fact, to get the discussion going. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this introduction. I think we are all looking forward uh, to reading this book, or to pick and choose, you know, as you said. Uh, it's also no cherry, no cherry picking as the British. Yeah, I was going to say it's an interesting use, phrase that you, use, uh, that you used uh, in this debate on EU skepticism. But um, I would like to go, go now directly into the debate and maybe start uh, with uh, Frank uh, Schimmelfenig, who is the author, as you has, have mentioned, of the chapter on Switzerland. And uh, so without further ado, Frank Schimmelfenig, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Niklaus, also to uh, Paul for um, getting this process going and editing the book. So, uh, as you said, uh, the uh, subtitle is uh, Views from the Capital. So, um, what I will present is, uh, of course, not a view from the capital because uh, Zurich is not the capital, as you know, even though it likes to think of it as uh, downtown Switzerland. Um, but uh, uh, I will basically follow the uh, um, structure that Niklaus outlined and, and talked to these three points, yeah, the drivers of uh, Euroscepticism, the um, deadlock situation in which uh, EU-Swiss relations are currently uh, caught and um, the way out um, as far as we can uh, think of it. So uh, when explaining uh, Swiss Euroscepticism, people really like to uh, point to very specifically Swiss features. Yeah? Uh, so what is often mentioned is the uh, traditional institutional trinity of uh, direct democracy, decentralization and neutrality as things that set Switzerland apart uh, from uh, other European countries. And uh, it's hard to deny that these actually play a role. But what I really want to emphasize is that Swiss Euroscepticism is actually quite typical of uh, rich, well-governed northern European countries. So these countries uh, do not need the EU uh, for uh, institutions for, let's say, overcoming um, 
traditional uh, conflictual relations with their neighbors. Um, they don't need it for institutional improvement, for democratic consolidation or economic subsidies as uh, the original member states, Eastern and Southern um, member states uh, did or do, but um, they rather fear yeah, that uh, deep integration might actually weak their strong national institutions and also turn them into, into net payers. Uh, into the uh, uh, European Union budget. Uh, what they really want from the EU is access to the internal market. And it is, it is this goal of maximizing access while minimizing regulatory and institutional integration that uh, creates a permanent conflict with the EU. Uh, because the EU, on the other hand, typically says, uh, if you want market access, you need to play by our rules. And the more market access you want, the more you need to accept a level playing field, EU law and supranational mechanisms of rulemaking, monitoring and jurisdiction. So uh, specifically, currently in the Swiss case, the EU demands an institutional agreement that provides for these um, supranational mechanisms uh, like dynamic uh, adaptation to EU law, um, let's say more supranational monitoring and also some um, judicial mechanisms in addition to the traditional diplomatic mechanisms of dispute settlement between the EU and Switzerland. And it demands that in return for granting Switzerland improved access uh, to its internal market. So again, this is not a specific policy that the EU has towards Switzerland, but it's a, it's a, a, a general policy that the EU has to outsiders. And uh, we see the same kind of demands and the same kind of conflict currently in the uh, Brexit negotiations, the negotiations on the future relationship between the EU and Switzerland. So this is, uh, this is the basic situation which has been there for a long time. So why is it so difficult now to reach a deal? Um, and here we can, we, can, we can point to and discuss uh, uh, several issues, of course. Uh, one is that the Swiss system is, of course, famous for its many veto points and consensus seeking mechanisms that take a long time to uh, produce a consensus. Uh, but that's, that's been the case. Um, all along, what is what is really new this time is uh, uh, that we don't only see the usual opposition from the populist right concerned about losses of sovereignty, um, but what we what is new is that we also see opposition from the from the left uh, concerned about uh, uh, the future of the so-called flanking measures which serve, for instance, to uh, protect wages uh, and the, the high wages uh, uh, that uh, we have in Switzerland. Now, this, uh, this mix of, um, say, sovereignty-based and economic Euroscepticism or protectionism uh, would make it very hard to, uh, for any agreement between the EU and Switzerland to um, survive a referendum. Um, I think a second point is that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, flux currently in EU negotiations uh, with uh, outsiders. The Swiss government has tried to hold out and watch how the Brexit negotiations go um, for the past few years in order to see whether Switzerland might actually get a better deal along the lines of any future EU-UK um, uh, agreement, but um, good luck with that. <laughs> finally, uh, I think um, Switzerland also has good reasons, yeah, not to move because it it benefits strongly from the from the current arrangement. Uh, it would, of course, even benefit more from additional market access. But of course, we know from let's say the politics of trade negotiations. Uh, that um, uh, foregone opportunities carry less weight than uh, actual losses for some well-organized groups. So to sum up, what can be done uh, to unblock this situation? Um, uh, 
uh, first of all, and uh, uh, responding to uh, Paul's uh, interjection, I think it is illusionary for Switzerland to count on a much better deal in the, in the future. If uh, Brexit has done anything, uh, it, it, it has hardened the EU's resolve to defend the integrity of the single market and the level playing field aspirations. Um, Switzerland benefits from the fact that the EU currently has more important things to worry about, but the day of reckoning will uh, sure come. Uh, second, uh, to create movement on the Swiss side and to get Switzerland out of its comfort zone, the EU will and probably must also continue to try to turn the stalemate that we currently see into a hurting stalemate. Uh, for instance, by refusing regulatory equivalence as it has done with the stock exchange or by uh, refusing uh, to renew expiring market access agreements. And finally, uh, I think uh, there will be a time when the Swiss government, the federal council, We'll need to show some leadership on this, on this issue, uh, sign the agreement and start the ratification process. Uh, this will of course be risky for the reasons that I pointed out, uh, but so far there has uh, generally been a popular majority supporting the continuation of bilateralism, especially uh, when the economic costs of leaving the bilateral way were significant and transparent. And I think both the EU and the Swiss government can, can create that uh, transparency and point at the significance. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frank Schimmelfennig, for, this, for these uh, interesting remarks. Uh, I would like to uh, invite now maybe Christa Markwalder uh, to give her introductory statement. And also maybe, because maybe not everybody is so familiar with the details of this institutional framework agreement and even those who are might have forgotten a bit where we stand in this process because a lot, you know, not so much has actually moved uh, in the last year. So maybe you could also uh, try to bring us up to speed from the perspective of a, a politician. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you also for your very interesting introduction remarks, Frank. So uh, where do we come from and where do we want to go to? First of all, Switzerland missed probably the perfect date to join the European Union. That would have been 1995, together <laughs> with Austria, Finland and Sweden. So together with the three other neutral northern countries, together with the last net payers that joined the European Union. So that would have been the moment and I'm sure that Switzerland would be a highly respected and very active member as we are member of many many other international organizations and why did we miss this date because we had a negative vote in 1992 not to join the european economic era and then the way the bilateral so-called bilateral way started by negotiating um, bilateral market access treaties and later on also to join uh, European uh, treaties like the Schengen Dublin Treaty and also being committed to uh, to contribute financially by the so-called uh, cohesion billion that Switzerland um, uh, contributed to European projects. Um, today what we want where do we want to go to is to stable our relations by having a solid uh, legal uh, background or fundament uh, with an institutional framework agreement. This was, by the way, not a request first of the European Union, but it was the idea was originally developed in Switzerland, uh, which is uh, today not so well known. Often people think in public discussions that it was a demand by the European Union, but it's in both of our interests because we have so close relations, uh, also political relations, but also, of course, uh, economic and business relations, that we need to have uh, good and stable uh, relations and to being reliable partners to each other. In, nine, uh, in 2013, um, the mandate uh, was accepted by the, uh, to negotiate this institutional framework agreement, was accepted by both uh, 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 committees for foreign affairs of the National Council and the Senate, and then the negotiations 
went along about five years, uh, many, many negotiation rounds. And the result was published in December 2018. The result is very respectable. So when you see where we started and where we landed, I really have to say we, our negotiation team made a very, very good job because many uh, requests from Switzerland were accepted or compromises were found. And uh, it was a, a little bit a pity that after publishing this t treaty text, the public discussion mainly went about points that weren't uh, either within the uh, agreement or in the draft agreement, or uh, that uh, the, the priority was on concrete topics that were not yet negotiated because, uh, for instance, the question of state ads was not at the moment really a, a, a big uh, topic, while now during the corona crisis this topic has a complete different dimension with all uh, the supportive packages from the different governments. Um, I mean, the, the ball is clearly within the playing field of Switzerland, so we have to respond now um, what we want to do with this uh, text, the uh, EU signalized uh, towards Switzerland that they are not ready to reopen the negotiations. And uh, as you said before, Frank, at this time, the opposition is not only coming from uh, right position parties like the Swiss People's Party, but also from the trade unions and the left-wing parties. And this is politically spoken a so-called unholy uh, an unholy alliance so when we have opposition from left and right it's very complicated to um, find majorities in a popular votes and i'm pretty sure that this uh, institutional framework agreement will be uh, part of a popular vote due to a, a referendum and of course we need to find compromises between the social partners. They have uh, the task also to present their solutions, but they didn't move so far. Um, within the government, the situation is also is blocked. So as long as the government, uh, the federal council consisting of uh, members of the four major political parties do not sign this treaty, the whole ratification process cannot start. And uh, as long as we cannot discuss it within the parliament or, or also in a popular vote, this unsolved solution remains. And I'm pretty sure that the uh, Brexit negotiation will not help us because this is a completely different situation to Switzerland. I compare it sometimes that the UK is in a position to uh, going to be divorced from the European Union while Switzerland uh, was never married. So we try <laughs> just uh, to regulate our unmarried situation with our most important partner, which are two different situations. And I really hope that we will uh, also maybe the corona crisis can be a trigger for this because we see how important the collaboration is. Uh, that we can in uh, due time find the way out, which means that first of all, our government has to move. Thank you so much, um, Krista. So we are waiting uh, still, or still in a, in, a, in a waiting period. Now I think like we've been waiting for this vote uh, on the so-called uh, Begrenzungs uh, uh, initiative or kind of the, the, the initiative to end free movement of persons, which has now due to the Corona crisis been postponed to September. So uh, we're still on hold, but uh, not forever, I would say. I mean, we see, uh, would you like to say something to that, Krista? Or? Yes, when I may add something to that, because I, I w wanted to mention it, but I forgot it during my introduction, Mark. Um, it, it was uh, like an um, informal agreement between the Swiss government and the European Union that until May 17, um, everything stayed, or, or both sides stay calm because mm -hmm. then it was planned to have the vote on the so-called limitation initiative. As you said, Niklaus, uh, this initiative 
wants to end the free movement of persons treaty. And together with this, uh, if, if it would be accepted, it would be a collapse of the bilateral way because all the bilateral market access treaty uh, would fall away and would fall apart. And the, our government decided uh, to postpone this vote to uh, 27 of September. And I mean, from my perspective, this was not the wisest decision during the Corona crisis because I'm very uh, I'm concerned that now with the whole developments, especially e economic developments, it will not be the better date in September than it would have been in May. And I'm pretty sure that our citizens would have uh, also voted in May um, against this initiative. Let's see what happens in September. It will not be easier, I mean, but I still hope that um, a majority of the citizens will back the bilateral way as they did it in the past uh, several times, uh, apart from 2014. Uh, when another uh, popular initiative against so-called mass immigration was accepted. But this has also consequences for the timeline regarding to Brexit, because we are coming um, closer to the end of the year when the Brexit should happen. And we cannot always wait or, uh, or expect from the European Union that they wait until the Swiss have voted, until the Swiss have done their own internal decision, but the, it, we have also to accept that there are external factors as the exit date of the UK uh, that may uh, have having uh, impact on the position of the EU Commission regarding Switzerland and the process of the institutional framework agreement. Thank you so much, uh, Krista, for uh, clarifying this timetable for us and uh, you know yeah, as you said maybe it's not going to be easier uh, in a way to fight this uh, the, the, this battle for the campaigners against this initiative i would now like to bring in uh, uh, professor stephanie walter for her introductory remarks please yes thank you very much for having me um i have a big research project at the moment going on uh, which looks at how disintegration events such as brexit or the mass immigration initiative or Trump's withdrawal from the climate change um, reverberates in other countries. And a big part of that study is Switzerland because Switzerland is an interesting case because as we've just heard, we have both the option of sort of withdrawing from an existing international agreement with the Begrenzungsinitiative, but we also have the option of going further with the institutional framework agreement. So it's really an exciting case to study these reverberations and also the other way around. So I have prepared um, a few slides because I thought I'd show you some of the data that we have been collecting uh, in the course of this project. Um, and I should say that this project is funded by the ERC. Um, so, oops, let's just see. Okay, so one of the things, uh, you know, that, that sort of have been part of the, the remarks by, by Frank and Christa already, um, but that have not been so explicit is the role of expectations about what the EU will do. And I've been doing quite a lot of work on what, what people think about what the consequences would be of limiting, say, the bilateral treaties, of terminating the free movement of uh, people a treaty, for example. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this, uh, what this then means for Swiss Euroscepticism. Because in deciding on what to do, people think about what will be the economic and social and political consequences um, of either sort of integrating further and, and sort of like having closer ties with the EU or, um, or really like taking the step back. And the interesting thing about that is, of course, these consequences don't just depend on what Switzerland does, but they depend to a large part on what the EU does. And the expectations about what the EU will do, they vary widely. And that's something we have seen in other cases as well. I mean, in, in Greece before the 2015 referendums, the expectations for what would happen varied widely before the Brexit referendum, expectations vary, vary widely. And also here in, in Switzerland, we see a lot of variation. What we have here is uh, data from a survey that we did in late October and November of last year. And we asked people what they think will happen if, um, the, if Switzerland votes to terminate the free movement of people treaty in the, in the uh, Begrenzungsinitiative that will be voted on now in September. 
And what you can see is that those who are uh, very much um, convinced that they will vote in favor of that initiative, they are much more optimistic that the EU will not really uh, restrict the encompassing access. That's what's in currently enjoys to the internal market. Whereas those who are um, strongly in favor, uh, uh, strongly against that initiative, are much more pessimistic. Right. Um, so they. Th you know, many people don't think that access will be completely terminated, but there's a lot of people who think that there will be some, uh, some more uh, restrictions and some severe restrictions. Interestingly, we see also variation when it comes to the question of what will happen if the negotiations about the framework agreement will fail. Um, with again, um, here I have it by party with uh, those, um, the SVP voters who is the populist right party in Switzerland being much more optimistic that if, if the negotiations fail now and we have a new, like we start new negotiations about basically a future relationship, about the bilateral relationship between Switzerland and the EU, that then the EU would be making much more concessions uh, than right now. But the interesting thing is that more or less, I mean, most people think that there will not be much change. And that I think is interesting because as we've just heard, the strategic situation is not so clear that if everything fails now and we start afresh, that there will really be, that Switzerland will be able to achieve exactly the same uh, treaty that they have negotiated now, because as Christa Markwalda pointed out, the, the, the result is actually quite good for, for Switzerland. And it's not clear that if we started now, we would be in such a good position now. So I think the interesting thing here is, in addition to that, you see that the party, uh, like that, that we have a lot of variation by party in how pessimistic or optimistic people are, that most people actually think the consequences are not so large. Whereas I think um, I would say that it's not so clear that there will not be more consequences. So then a big question, of course, comes is why is the EU so reluctant to compromise? Like, why don't they just get, give Switzerland what it wants? After all, it's just small, it's not so important, and, and so on. Yeah, I mean, in, in the big EU picture, they could just be giving us, after all, we trade a lot of them outside the EU. Uh, Switzerland is like the third uh, biggest trading partner of the EU. So there's lots of reasons for the EU to just sort of say, you know, we, we, we want to maintain close relations. Let's just compromise on these issues that are still outstanding. Now, the problem is that when you have um, a mutually agreed compromise, such as the Free Movement of People Treaty, um, or also an agreed treaty such as the, 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 um, the uh, Institutional Framework Agreement, which has been negotiated now, um, that is usually costly for, for the other party, right? I mean, uh, on the one hand, um, all of these treaties are essentially compromises that sort of, that create some gains for both, but there's a division on how these gains are distributed. And if you change that, then one party gets more than the other. So it's always a distributed issue. Um, but when you have these withdrawals, and this is the same in, in situations such as Brexit for the EU as well, then you know they, there's always different choices that you can make. On the one hand, they can just accommodate, in this case, Switzerland, and just say, well, we'll just give them the compromises. It's, it's less ideal for us that we want it, but at least we can maintain um, all the trade relations that we have. So the advantage is that you can maintain the cooperation gains, trade, research cooperation, electricity, uh, and so on, all these kind of things. So that speaks, that's, you know, the, 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 the wish to maintain these things and the wish to avoid losing these advantages, that speaks in favor of accommodating Switzerland in this case. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that there's a risk that other countries will say, that's actually a good thing. Let's, let's try the same. Like, why can Switzerland get these exemptions? We want to get these exemptions too. And so you have the risk that you have political contagion, that these demands to, to not comply with the rules, to get sort of these cherry picking arrangements, that that will spread. And that can actually create some instability for the EU. So this really creates a dilemma for the EU, uh, which it has to navigate. And I think it's important for the Swiss debate to understand that it's not just the EU being stubborn and trying to play its power, but that it's really, there are real concerns in, in the EU uh, uh, that, that go in this direction. Here is um, a survey that I ran in, uh, in the EU 27, so the, the, um, the current EU uh, in December 2018. This is a question on, on Brexit. But I asked people what they think as the most important uh, goal of the negotiations, of the Brexit negotiations. What should be the, the negotiation goal of the EU? Uh, and there's lots of interesting stuff in there, but uh, let me point you to two things. The, the one interesting thing is that about a quarter of Europeans think that the key goal should be 
that um, for the EU should be that other countries uh, uh, do not leave the EU in the future. And 40% of the Europhiles um, underline this. And perhaps the even more interesting finding is for the Eurosceptics, because more than half of the Eurosceptics, like 50.9%, um, say that the main goal for the EU should be to establish a standard procedure that makes it easier for countries to leave the EU in the future. So what this shows is that Eurosceptics elsewhere watch the negotiations with other uh, countries very closely and see it as a blueprint for their own uh, possible exit negotiations or, or future negotiations with the EU as well. So the concern of political contagion is not unfounded and there's, there's more evidence uh, that I have that really shows that these political contagion effects are not just some fantasy, but they actually exist and it's a, it's, it's a risk that the, that the EU really confronts. It can also go in the other direction. We've talked a lot about the role of Brexit uh, for um, Switzerland. Here, um, I ran two survey waves just before and after the Brexit, the first Brexit chaos of last year. So uh, the UK was supposed to leave the EU in um, March 20, uh, 2019. But as you probably remember, um, they couldn't sort of agree on, on a solution. Then we had two weeks of absolute chaos where nobody really knew what was going to happen, whether uh, Britain was going to just like leave with no deal, whether they were going to remain after all, or whether there was going to be an extension. In the end, there was an extension. And then I ran a second survey and I asked exactly the same questions about vote intentions for different uh, upcoming referendums. The, uh, the weapons referendum uh, last spring, which was essentially about, like would have had implications for terminating the Schengen Agreement. The uh, limitation initiative, a hypothetical referendum about terminating the bilateral treaties and the framework agreement. And what you can see is that the support for uh, voting in a non-cooperative way, right, so against sort of EU cooperation, was reduced after this chaos. So Brexit had a, um, really had a, a, the effect of, of making the Swiss respondents, this is all Swiss respondents, more wary about taking like sort of, sort of um, such a risky path, essentially. Right? So, but of course, the negotiations can be interpreted in different ways. And what we see is that, uh, that Brexit is being watched very closely in Swiss politics. Um, and here you have two tweets, uh, basically, uh, within two days um, after the, uh, when, when Boris Johnson made this new deal uh, with the EU to actually leave the EU. And uh, we have Roger Köppel from the populist right SVP who says, um, um, you know, even with the framework, with the framework agreement with Switzerland, the EU also always says it's not going to renegotiate, but now it did negotiate. So it's really uh, important to take this as an example. And then you have uh, Elisabeth Schneider Schneider from the uh, sort of centrist uh, TVP who says, uh, finally, Johnson has realized that the, 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 the uh, British government, uh, the British economy would not survive a no deal Brexit. Uh, and for the Swiss economy, it's the same. We cannot, we cannot let the bilateral um, treaties erode. So you can see the exact same thing is being interpreted in very different ways. Um, so Brexit really has effects, but this also goes the other way because in Britain, people are watching the negotiations between Switzerland and the EU as well. And this explains why it's so hard for the EU Commission because of these political contagion risks to make these compromises because it's not just about Switzerland, but it's about negotiations more generally. And given that the EU is very much under pressure from Eurosceptics throughout, and not just in Switzerland, not just in the UK, but in other countries as well, that really limits the room to maneuver. And that makes the situation that um, Switzerland is experiencing now also very different from when it was first negotiating the bilateral treaties in the late 90s and early 2000s. So to conclude, we can see that those pushing for looser relations with the EU are much more optimistic about the likely EU response than those advocating for maintaining or deepening the close relations, but the EU's room to compromise is limited because of these concerns about contagion. Okay, so that's it. Thank you so much for these uh, very interesting and enlightening remarks. Um, the clock is ticking, as uh, Michel Barnier used to say in the first uh, the phase of the Brexit negotiations. And I uh, would like to give the floor to Paul Schmidt, but maybe ask you to be a little bit shorter than you had anticipated. You've already spoken uh, at the beginning about the book, so we can we do have enough time to uh, bring in uh, also the audience. Thank you so much, Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you, Niklas. No, I, I already talked in the beginning, so I'll be very short, and I don't, I, I, I won't give any presentation. But I would just. Um, um, 
throw into the discussion some of thoughts which I which came to my mind when I when I listened uh, to you, and um, it, it seems like it always depends on your perspective, no? Because if you ask the question like Stephanie, why Walter did in, in one industry right now, which was based on the studies and the opinion polls that that her center did. Is the EU actually ready to compromise? I mean, from an EU perspective, the question would rather be the other way around. Is when is Switzerland ready to compromise, in fact? Because if you, it all, always depends on, on, I mean, size matters in the end. And, and uh, why would, uh, I think Stephanie hinted to it in, in her conclusions, why, why would the European Union in a, in a very um, difficult situation actually um, have any interest uh, to, to, to compromise from their side when one of the main objectives, in fact, is to have a level playing field between the EU member countries so there will be no special deals for uh, outside uh, European countries. I would say, I mean, the single market works because it is rule-based and you have to stick to that rules. If you don't stick to that rules, um, you, run, you run into, into uh, tough questions and, and problems. And I think uh, my question would be to the others, uh, where is uh, Switzerland uh, ready to compromise? And I, um, and I, I found uh, Krista's uh, comparison <laughs> very nice that uh, Switzerland is not married to the European Union, but maybe it's maybe we are all in a sort of a patchwork family, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> patchwork family situation uh, where members of the family come and go, or you have uh, um, uh, cousins which are more which you haven't seen in quite a long time, but. But still, even in a in a patchwork family, I mean, you can't always choose the family members because uh, they are. Um, it has to do with proximity and, and geography, and um, I would be I would be interesting in I would be interested in learning more about uh, the dynamic of public opinion in Switzerland and how actually um, how actually the 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 attitude towards the European Union um, evolves. And because Stephanie uh, mentioned in the end uh, the, the data that, that she has regarding EU public opinion and the way EU should be treating uh, the United Kingdom, um, I can only say from an Austrian perspective that um, here public opinion uh, and, and the attitude, public attitude, is very, very sensitive when it comes to uh, special deals for, for other countries, when it comes to um, cherry picking, the term in which we um, sometimes, uh, sometimes is used in a fair kind of way, but, but not always, I would say. But it is used in relation to, to the relations with, with the UK. And, and here Austrians are very, very sensitive, sensible and, and negative about this because they, they want to see that, that, that everything is equal, in fact, and, and that, that others are, are not treated in a more equal way than, than, than we are treated because in particular from, from, from a small-sized uh, country's perspective, I think... Uh, in, in particular, for an open economy, uh, it is it is very important how the, the single market is actually structured, and and how big big countries are are, are treated. And and uh, in in particular, against the background of this uh, whole co corona pandemic, and when we talk about state aid and the role of state aid and the differences between the country and the way we get out of this crisis, is it an asymmetric? exit out of this crisis, who has more possibilities to support their economy? I mean, this, this can't be just uh, the, the law of, of, of who's, who's stronger than the other. This has to be fair play for everyone. And uh, I think EU relations with Switzerland need to be based on fair play and uh, 
fair play is defined differently in Switzerland than maybe in Brussels. But uh, attention should be given that, that those rules are implemented in a fair kind of way, I would say. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Paul. Um, already invite you, um, the, the dear audience, to submit your questions. I don't know if I already have, I don't have any written questions yet so far, but you can uh, raise your hand and, uh, or uh, write your questions from this moment. I would like to, to start the discussion and uh, maybe also change a bit to a format where we have a bit uh, more exchange and uh, slightly uh, shorter answers. I mean, one of the things that you said, Paul, uh, would, be would be interesting, uh, you know, in what way uh, public opinion uh, differs maybe, or what is the, the, the evolution of public opinion in Switzerland compared uh, to other countries? And do we, is it actually true as uh, uh, Frank Schimmelfenig said, that we're, the Switzerland is not really such a special case, uh, that it's just comparable uh, to any other northern um, uh, European country who only wants kind of the access to the market and not much integration. Do we, uh, Stephanie, what, do you want to um, chime in here? Sure. I mean, I think what is really fascinating to me always is if you if you ask uh, people what they think about the EU, whether it's positive or negative. I mean, you get a pretty good uh, distribution everywhere in the EU with a lot of people saying it's not good and a lot of people saying it's, it's good and then some saying very bad and very good. If you look at Switzerland, you basically have no one who says the EU is very positive. It's really fascinating that that share is much, much lower. So overall, I think the Swiss are much more critical towards the EU than, um, than the other EU members. That's not the case when you ask about the bilateral treaties. Those are seen much more positively. But sort of the general evaluation of the EU is, is much more negative. My sense is, and I, I don't really have the data to back this up, but my sense from just looking at the dynamics is that one of the issues that has happened in uh, Switzerland, which is different from other countries, and I think here is here's where it matters on whether you are in a EU country or not in a EU country, is that after the um, after the 92 referendum and the rejection of um, um, of EA membership of Switzerland and so on, and then you had the, the uh, bilateral treaty negotiations, but then the discourse basically at some point worked in a way that the the, the, the populist right talked about the EU and how bad it is, and the pro EU camp stopped talking about the EU. So basically there was, I mean, it was not a winning topic at all uh, in national politics. So they just stopped talking about it. They still supported uh, uh, They supported the bilateral way. They supported it when it came to referendums, but it not, was not something that proactively, many people said, look, the EU is a positive thing. And I think that has shifted the discourse in Switzerland to a way where now the, the norm is that the EU is not good. So even people who, who, you know, who are, in favor, so say, in favor of the framework agreement, th they will often say things like, well, I also don't think that the EU is good, but we need the bilateral treaties, rather than just saying the EU is a good project. And there, I think you have much more variation in most EU countries where you have the Eurosceptics, but you also have people pointing out why the EU is important. And I think that that is, if you ask about the dynamics and what has changed, I think that's the interesting thing that the discourse has really sort of led to hege hegemony of the Eurosceptic discourse, which now has sort of shifted sort of the, the, what, what is the EU, the perception of what the EU is, or the EU is not good, but we need to cooperate with them. That's sort of the, the argument of the, of the uh, proponents rather than, than just like, this is a good thing. Wonderful. Um, we have the, uh, the first participant who has actually raised uh, her hand and would like uh, to join the debate. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome now Krista Tobler. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Thank you. Krista Tobler from the Universities of Basel in Switzerland and Leiden in the Netherlands. And I would like to add a bit of anecdotal evidence to what Professor Walter just said about the Eurosceptic attitude, which is much more geared towards the EU as such 
than the bilateral relationship. And that has to do with the, the recent judgment of the German Constitutional Court on the public sector purchase program. I had uh, an interview in the Swiss Neue Social Zeitung on that matter. And you cannot believe how many negative comments it received online, all of which are about how dreadful the EU is as such and how much it tries to impose its ways of thinking on its member states and on everyone else. In my opinion, that reflects entirely what Professor Walter just said, a very, very negative attitude uh, to the European Union uh, without actually going into the subject matter of what this whole issue is about, the rather technical subject matter. But I even had comments such as there is no such thing as for example, primacy of EU law over national law because the EU is not a state, it cannot even exist. You know, it, it does reflect, I believe, what we just heard. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know, Frank Schimmelfenig, would you like to, to, to add something on, these, uh, on, on the EU, uh, on the attitudes in Switzerland towards the EU? Or well, Sir <coughs> Christa Tobler? So, Michael. My initial com comparison was actually with countries like like Norway, yeah, where I think you have a similar attitude. Yeah, where you, also when you when you ask people, would you like to join the EU? You are in the single digits as you are in Switzerland, and it is mainly seen as a relationship of necessity yeah, rather than uh, affection. And I would also venture to uh, uh, say that uh, when you look at the online comments. Uh, let's say for in any member state journal, yeah, you will you will find the same kind of uh, dominance of negative comments. I think that has more to do with the medium than with the with the message. Um, so uh, so in that respect, I think um, uh, Switzerland definitely is comparable. I think the 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 more important issue uh, uh, really is um, um, how. Is, is the salience yeah, of the uh, uh, economic issue, the necessity issue. Yeah? How, uh, how much can campaigns uh, ahead of a referendum, yeah, that will always happen every other two or three years, uh, of how much the campaign can, can, can uh, demonstrate uh, uh, to the people uh, what is at, at, at stake. And I think here also uh, Stefanie's results are, are are important. So I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm not quite sure at this moment whether the strong correlation uh, between optimism about better deals and the and the uh, position you have on the on the institutional framework agreement is is more than just motivated reasoning, or whether it whether the causal relationship is is really between how you think the EU will react and what position you take. But if we assume yeah, that um, that there, there is this uh, a causal relationship, then of course it 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 uh, uh, um, it shows yeah how important it is. Um, uh, to try to convince people yeah, th uh, uh, that, uh, first of all, uh, there's a very low likelihood uh, that you could get a better deal than the one that has been negotiated, which I think Switzerland uh, has negotiated well, and I think it's, it's, it, it has reached a good compromise here, uh, and uh, uh, how the EU will likely react. And I think um, it's, it's up to both the EU and to the Federal Council uh, to uh, frame the debate in a way that the, that the stakes become really clear. Maybe we can uh, uh, bring in here a question that uh, uh, came from Thomas Miljerina, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, journalist for the Swiss uh, Italian uh, language, uh, television and radio RSI in uh, Brussels. And he says, uh, the latest spring economic forecast lists the high dependency of Switzerland from the EU internal market as one of the country-specific risks for the future. And he asks, is there awareness of this in Switzerland and how will it influence political thinking? Maybe Krista, would you like to uh, answer or try to answer that question? Thank you very much. Uh, I would say the, the, the general awareness of our interdependence is high uh, uh, among the citizens, the business persons, 
but also among uh, politicians. Uh, however, the EU, as in as the with it, with its institutions, is something which also creates a lot of emotions. And uh, as we have heard recently, rather uh, or also skeptic or negative emotions, um, I would say the fact or the, the perception of a rather negative uh, image of the EU in Switzerland comes also from the fact that Switzerland was not uh, affected directly by the Second World War and therefore we do not appreciate the peace project as much as our neighbor countries do and this is probably one of the reasons and recently we also have to say the EU suffered uh, and its members countries but also other countries were affected from many crises uh, like the debt crisis, like uh, also the migration crisis, and all these crises did not help to create a, a really positive image or how it, uh, um, single EU countries handled them. However, uh, I think Swiss citizens vote in general uh, with a very, uh, from a very sovereign perspective and also see how much uh, integrated Switzerland is economically into the European single market. Uh, if you see now also that uh, because uh, of uh, the Corona crisis, uh, a lot of uh, supply chains were broken or did not work properly. Also, the borders were closed for a free movement and you see the economic damages of this. So this has to be the best proof how important openness and also uh, interdependence or cross-border interdependence is for our economy. I think that this awareness is in place, but we always have to emphasize these important facts. Can I, Nicolas, can I just two add things? Uh, two, uh, can I just add two things which I think are important? Something that, that Krista said. Uh, and which also related maybe to, to the UK situation, uh, a sim similarity, no? One thing is that economic interdependence is very, very strong, but we know that emotions are, in particular in referendum situations, much stronger than ec the economic argument. And the second thing uh, which strikes me is uh, something that Krista said, which you also hear when you, when you talk with analysts in the UK, that this sense of what a uh, what uh, this sense of what the second world war did to the continent of what nationalism does at uh, this uh, experience of war um, is something um, which which which, all, which is also lacking in, in 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 the british society and which on the continent uh, are, are where and are still the main drivers for this for this integration. I think these are two patterns which are which are quite quite similar. I would say. On the other hand, Switzerland uh, geographically is not really an island, although emotionally maybe it is. I don't know. It's, it's, yes, Switzerland is sometimes uh, considered uh, being an island. I would like to uh, actually stick a bit to this uh, the subject of. Uh, economic uh, dependency and uh, bring in uh, one anonymous um, uh, member of the audience who asks, is there an observable divide between Swiss industry stakeholders based on the nature of their economic activity? If yes, which industries are pro and which are against closer EU relations? Do, does somebody have any insights or even data to answer that question? Well, I, I try to do so. So, in general, you can say the, the, the business world is very much uh, in favor of having uh, close and stable relations to the European Union, since they know exactly that uh, the interdependence, as we, has heard, as we have heard before, is very high. And we know that Switzerland is one of the most integrated countries into the European single market. Um, we are home of many internationally operating 
companies, for them, it's not as important as, for instance, for small and medium enterprises uh, to have these market accesses because they can organize themselves among uh, along uh, the the globe where uh, to produce, where to how to organize their supply chains, and uh, I would say the a, a kind of skepticism comes from maybe the smallest businesses which do not have any cross-border activities and they sometimes do not really realize how much um, in, uh, interaction there are between smallest and small businesses with medium-sized and big business and they are of course uh, operating successfully from Switzerland to many other countries. Our uh, quota for foreign trade is in between on 96 percent of uh, the, the GDP. So this is very, very high and underlines the importance of having good relations with our most important trade partners. I wouldn't say that there are really industry sectors that are, are, are not in favor of having market access treaties. Uh, I would say it's rather coming from the size or from the, those who just operate within the region or the country. Thank you so much. We have another question uh, from a member of the audience who would uh, like to ask uh, the question live. I would uh, give the floor to Shak Beglinger, please. You have to unmute, or maybe I And present yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. My name is Jacques Beglinger. I'm uh, from Switzerland and involved in uh, rather on the economic side. And I would like to, to ask a question relating to the equivalence regimes. Well, removing stock exchange adequacy made much noise in Switzerland. And in fact, unilateral this EU decisions in this respect are a powerful tool also in the Brexit context. Now, the data protection adequacy report on the 10th of June, as I heard, is uh, just uh, on the doorsteps. And financial matters and digitalization are matters in which the UK sees hotspots too. My question is rather to the political experts, is the EU aware that unilateral decisions have the potential to raise negative feelings and also in the aftermath to disrupt reasonable talks? Thank you so much. That's a, a very interesting question. I also remember very well last year, you know, how much uh, drama there was around uh, this uh, um, adequacy decision um, for the Swiss stock exchange. The effects economically, or, kind of, or let's say the effects politically at least, just didn't seem to be that big. But maybe uh, some of our panelists uh, have, uh, you know, maybe they influenced, uh, uh, you know, emotionally or kind of or, or behaviors or attitudes towards the EU. Do we have any information on that? We haven't really looked at sort of the emotional uh, things uh, of, of this side. But I think the interesting thing is, of course, the EU for a long time tried to keep a very low profile and always tried to coax and explain why it's important. And it's not like... Um, the Swiss have become more Europhile because of that. I, I, this is really anecdotal evidence, but I was invited to a luncheon with some EU ambassadors a while ago. And they asked me like, what can we do to, to make people in Switzerland understand better that we're not the enemy, that this is actually, you know, that there's a lot of sort of mutual interest and so on. So I think it's, um, the EU is also trying to figure out how can they assert themselves and sort of show like their strategic interests. I mean, Paul before said, why should the EU compromise at all? And, you know, this question shows you that in, in, in Switzerland, it's kind of like perceived, why should they not? And I think, so I think they're in this, this problem that they're trying to make their point and say, look, you also benefit. And if you don't have this cooperation, we can actually also play bad. And it's much better to have us as a friend. But of course, it comes across, it's a really risky strategy because it can, can create resentment too. So there's the problem with this strategy that it can create, it can backfire. At the same time, I think the EU sort of, the, the idea was to sort of show, look, we really, we mean it after years and years and years, because as we've heard before, I mean, this whole 
institution framework agreement, which was in, in initially initiated, as, as Lisa Marco has said, by Switzerland, like almost 10 years ago, or even more than 10 years ago, this process has been going on and on and on. There just seems to be no end. And I think it's, it's sort of, it shows the frustration of the EU that they really don't know what to do anymore. And then, of course, if you threaten, as they did, and then don't follow through, then, of course, uh, in strategic terms, that's not really ideal either. If you always say, well, but if you don't do it, then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do this. And then, ah, yeah, we'll give you another extension. You're not credible anymore, right? So I think the EU also put itself into a bind there. But it's a difficult situation. I think, I think you're right that it can really go in both ways. But maybe if I can say one thing, because I think, because that's related to also Frank's comments, to what extent these expectations are related to motivated reasoning. I think that that's a huge part of it, right? That people, people believe things that are consistent with what they want and the other way around. Um, and people then sometimes just adjust their expectations. So I did a survey, for example, in the UK just before the Brexit vote and 22% of leavers thought that they would lose full access to the single market in the case of Brexit. 22%, about one fifth. Nowadays, of course, everybody says, well, we always wanted that. That's not true. And we studied sort of how the evolution of expectations in, in Britain. And you do see that um, even leavers have become more uh, pessimistic, but at some point it's just like levels out. They don't adjust anymore. And the interesting thing is also the vote intentions don't change. So, so I think um, you can, uh, with, with rational arguments, or you know, as you saw in the, uh, the, the Brexit example that I showed you in vote intentions, you can reach some people who update their beliefs, but a lot, a big part with the motivated reasoning you, you don't reach. But of course, in a referendum where it's often very close, remember the mass immigration initiative was 50.2%. So um, it, it can be very close. So maybe it's enough to shift like three or 4% people's expectations, right? So in that sense, it can be perhaps effective because of course people who are against the EU anyways, they will resent the, the you know, the, the equivalence decision, but you, you may have lost them already anyway. So the question is, can you get the ones in the middle? Of the I think one also has to make, make clear that it is a standard practice of the EU to grant and withdraw these equivalence agreements uni laterally. And the only way to work around this is to uh, basically find an institutional uh, agreement with binding legal rules for both sides and that will that will do away with this um, um, ambivalence and the hard feelings on both sides. So I, I think the way forward is rather to say, okay, if these equivalence uh, agreements are uh, too, un too unstable, too, un too uncertain, let's, let's make binding rules. Uh, I'm not quite sure if that specific aspect of stock exchange would be covered now with the institutional agreement, but uh, 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 that's maybe a different question. Krista, did you want to did you want to say something? Uh, yes, please, uh, because um, I think so far the equivalence process was rather a technical process than a political one, mm -hmm. but uh, with the um, with, with the stock exchange equivalence, like a political game started and the negative game started because Switzerland also reacted itself by introducing protecting measures. And uh, for the, in the longer time, it's absolutely not sustainable for uh, the fin financial center nor for the stock exchange, uh, but nor for both sides. So it's, it's like a little bit more or less a lose-lose situation uh, instead of uh, continuing uh, good and, and positive collaboration. And uh, of course, there are other um, equivalences coming, as Jacques mentioned, the uh, data protection. Uh, and I, I really do hope so that the Swiss parliament um, does its uh, uh, job uh, very carefully in order that we are in line uh, and compliant with European data protection legislation in order that we also uh, get this equivalence. From my uh, personal opinion, we shouldn't uh, play these power games with equivalences that uh, create at the end of the day lose-lose situations. One, it's more for Switzerland, one, once it's more for uh, other or neighbor countries. But it, it depends also who is first to move out because Switzerland also the parliament blocked the new uh, cohesion contribution and so we also have there to find the trigger and the special moment when we deblock uh, this contribution 
and it's it's sometimes a little bit like a Mikado game. Who first moves loses. So uh, this is in politics sometimes um, uh, not very constructive. But I hope that one of the um, positive fallouts of the current crisis could also be that uh, Switzerland and the European Union go uh, together in the same direction because we have also a lot, a lot of common interests. And I have uh, just to mention one thing that we had some problems with neighbor countries like uh, Germany and France where uh, medical products that were ordered from Switzerland to Switzerland were blocked. And it was the EU Commission uh, which helped Switzerland to get to these products. And uh, it was maybe not mentioned really uh, enough in, in the public sphere, but I think uh, there Switzerland could really count on the EU Commission uh, that uh, the, uh, the rules were respected. Thank you so much. Uh, let's maybe shift a little bit the focus um, for, for, for the end of the debate towards the future and let's maybe start with the more immediate future and I would like to bring in a question from Manuela Rüecker uh, about the Begrenzungsinitiative or the Limitation Initiative and she asks in what way will the pandemic most likely affect the popular vote on the Begrenzungsinitiative um, for example, uh, the, are people going to realize there's a need of cross-border workers? Uh, is uh, more unemployment leading to uh, a lesser inclination uh, to implement free movement of people? Are there other reasons? Uh, um, maybe somebody could try to answer these questions, uh, Frank Schimmelfeni? I mean, I, I've, I, I have no uh, original data on this. I mean, what I, what I read in the, in the uh, news is that uh, the uh, corona pandemic has, let's say, has, um, has made the uh, um, situation more balanced again. Before that, it seemed quite clear yeah, that the uh, uh, initiative wouldn't pass. Now it seems to be more open. And I think the reasoning goes in, goes in two directions. Um, you have those that uh, uh, follow what you just said, Niklas, or what uh, Christa said before, uh, basically sh uh, the pandemic showing the, uh, uh, the importance of open borders. But of course, again, in line with motivated reasoning, you will have those that say, look, I mean, the pandemic again shows how tightly we need to control our borders and to make sure that not another virus comes in from Italy or from some other countries. We need to really keep these, uh, these borders tight and close. So again, I think it's, it's, it's probably how you, how you feel about openness yeah, that uh, uh, drives the, con the concerns into different direction. But I, I, I think um, uh, what, what, what the reason, what uh, pollsters currently say is that it has, has basically made the, uh, uh, the uh, issue more open, more open-ended and more undecided again. But I mean, if we are entering now in a period of economic crisis of unemployment, I mean, isn't there also a case to be made that, you know, in periods of uncertainty, uh, the Swiss usually don't want to add additional uncertainty, uh, Stephanie Walter. I mean, I think this was, as Frank just said, I think we don't know yet, but I think it would be really interesting. Uh, the data that I showed you from December, uh, from, from the fall of last year, it's actually a panel study. So we, we recontacted these people again, and the survey is right now in the field. So I, I will be able to tell you more in two or three weeks. And I'm really curious to see how vote intentions have changed, how views of openness, globalization, and so on have evolved uh, more generally in, in view of the pandemic, and whether people who are more affected or who also who feel who are emotionally more different, responding differently to the pandemic or something, how they are responding to the crisis. Because I think the arguments can really be made in, in both ways, both with regard to Europe, but also worldwide, right? Because we, we see how dependent we are on, on the world, but some people may also say, maybe we have become too dependent. And you see all the discourse going on already about renationalization. We need to make sure that we have these things. So I think there's a strong, there's different competing narratives right now, and it's not yet clear what which one will win out. I also think 
perhaps a bigger picture will at some point play a role depending on how the whole geopolitical situation with the US and China and so on evolves. Uh, so because of course, I mean, as Europeans, we're sort of caught in between, but for a long time, you know, the US was always squarely on our on our side and, and sort of in our camp and didn't really matter whether you were in the EU or out, you were always part of the West. That situation really has changed a little bit. If you look at also Donald Trump's threats, even now to like defund the World Health Organization and so on. So suddenly I think thinking more again about who are my allies, who do I belong to, which is my camp, I think might become more important again. So I think a lot will depend on how the whole discourse in Switzerland also evolves over the summer. And it's really hard to foresee right now because I can see narratives pointing in all different directions. Um, it's, it's hard for me to, to really make predictions right now because I, and I think as the crisis heats up, this, this, the economic fallout and the, this, 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 that sort of an additional narrative or, or like a question of how much uncertainty can we afford in these times that, that will probably gain in prominence also relative to now because of course now we already know what's coming but it's not really there yet but over the summer people will lose their jobs and so on it will become much more acute. Um, I would like to uh, bring in uh, Christa Markwalde, but like add one question that came in from uh, Darius Farman uh, from uh, the think tank Four Hours. And he says it's a question primarily for Christa Markwalde. Assuming the uh, limitation initiative will be rejected in September, which should not be taken for granted, how do you expect the political narrative to evolve afterwards in regard? Uh, in Switzerland regarding Swiss EU relations and the institutional framework agreement and how do you intend to contribute to it as a member of the National Council? Thank you very much. So first of all I'm pretty sure if the vote happened last Sunday the initiative would have been voted down as other initiatives were in, uh, in, in the past uh, apart from the exception in 2000 2014. Now, where does it go in uh, when we see how the economic situation evolves? I fear that it will be more complicated uh, if we have uh, increased unemployment rates and frustration uh, within the population to explain the importance of the principle of free movement of persons and also the benefits that Switzerland could really um, uh, um, gain from that during the past years. Um, you can measure it by the medium income of the, uh, of the people because uh, within 20 years in, uh, in, in, on an average, a, a medium income of a month uh, was uh, addition due to the free movement of persons, uh, people, and uh, principle. And um, what do I expect for September? I still hope that the argument of certainty for, uh, uh, for our companies, for the business environment, should really uh, reach uh, a majority of the people and also the su success of the bilateral treaties and the importance for our country and for our economy. And what, what's going on when the initiative will be voted down by end of September, I think then we really are ur in an urgent situation to unlock the, the institutional framework agreement and find quick solutions together with the EU, but before the end of the year, because I think it's better for Switzerland not to wait for the, the Brexit drama. It's better to move on and also to demonstrate leadership in European politics. Okay. Um, maybe let's um, try to bring it even or, or, or to, uh, take the argument a little bit further. You know, where, so if uh, we don't, or if Switzerland doesn't agree to this uh, institutional framework agreement, what would then be possible alternatives even? I mean, I, it, so are any outcome of the Brexit negotiations uh, potentially interesting for Switzerland? Uh, there's also one um, anonymous member of the audience who asked, what would be the future of Switzerland in the EFTA framework in terms of relations with the EU? 
Uh, but maybe we could also think about the current state of the EU in this pandemic and see this is, uh, you know, some people say it's uh, unfolding, we have borders up, there's the crisis in the Eurozone, uh, there is uh, the, 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 the ruling of the German Constitutional Court, Hungary uh, undermining the rule of law. So is, the, is it not just, just going to work to keep on muddling through? Do we really have to make uh, that decision right now? <laughs> I think the, this question would probably go to Krista or Stephanie. Well, then, Paul, it's always interesting to have like an outside view. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, it's already difficult to forecast the past, so I would not dare to forecast the, the future of the Swiss EU relations. But um, I mean, I agree with you that there are some challenges ahead. But I mean, the, the muddling through argument for European integration is. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's, that's the way forward. That's what it seems. But, but I, would not be, um, I would not be too pessimistic because, I mean, the, 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 the temporary closing of the national borders or even of regional the, the limit, limiting access to certain um, national regions. I mean, this is this is within the limits of the, of the treaty, of course. The fact that it didn't didn't um, wasn't implemented in a coordinated way, and 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 uh, is, is that's true, and that that's a problem. And we will see how the exit uh, of this situation will actually work. Um, but I, but you won't see, I mean, there's this, um, I agree with Frank and Stephanie that you have two narratives. And the question is, how much political responsibility do we have now? What is the political choice that political leaders will actually take? I mean, this is, a, I think, a decisive moment and an important uh, time. But, um, and there's also, of course, tension between the health situation and the defined criteria to assess the risk of contagion of the coronavirus on the one hand and on the other hand the economic argument where we know that tourism is 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 very is a very important element of our economies and even there you see from an austrian perspective that there are people within the austrian government who would Argue in public that um, who would who would promote the idea of 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 staying during vacations in Austria, <laughs> while on the other hand you would have people saying, uh, "Wait a minute! I mean, we're used to to going to many many other places, and this is about uh, free movement of people, and this will be very important for the whole of the European Union. This is not about um, a selfish interest of boosting your your." Uh, unique and individual tourism, but this, the, there are interlinkages and interdependencies which are really strong. And if Italy is not doing well, we will have serious problems with Italy being uh, one of our main uh, trading partners. So um, there is uh, to overstretch the limit of, to overstretch the limitation of free movement of people um, is, 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 is not a choice for us. I mean, uh, the free movement is, we see at the moment how important it is for our agriculture, for our critical infrastructure, for our health system, for our social system, for our food sector. I mean, this is, this, this is crucial for us. And um, I, I, I think, I think at this is the moment where we should emphasize how, how um, that we're not an island uh, in, within the European Union and that our future and our well-being depends very much on the welfare of our neighbors. I think this is crucial. This doesn't really say much about the uh, decision that Switzerland has to take, but I think Swiss, Switzerland is in a similar situation, even not being a member of the European Union. If you limit the free movement of people, you will probably have serious consequences. Thank you so much, Paul. This will, this will be a lose-lose situation, I would say. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, we, the clock is still ticking and the clock is actually ticking faster, but I would like to uh, invite the three other participants for uh, their final uh, statements. Unfortunately, we were not able to answer all the questions uh, from the audience, but most of them. But maybe if we could stick with that outlook, you know, what do we, if the, 
uh, Begrenzungsinitiative will be rejected, which is not a given, what will then happen? Is there an alternative, a feasible alternative to the institutional framework agreement, Krista? Uh, on the short term, no, because the institutional fra uh, framework agreement is a precondition for further market access treaties, uh, which is very clear. So all the other negotiations, for instance, the treaty on electricity remains blocked until we can unlock this discussion on the institutional framework agreement. Um, if it would fail, for instance, in a popular vote, the basic discussion would re be reopened, how to organize our relations to the European Union, but we would not move uh, back to field one, we would move back to field zero minus. That means that uh, when everything is broken, it's not better to build something new up. So we should uh, continue on short term, pragmatic, this bilateral approach, which was for uh, both sides uh, successful and uh, creates benefit for uh, Switzerland and the European Union. Uh, Stephanie Walter, maybe also on is there any outcome of the Brexit negotiations that might be interesting uh, to Switzerland? Well, I mean, I, I think with the Brexit negotiations, also very much in the up in the air of, of what will happen because right now, I mean, there's lots of posturing and, and there's a real risk of a real no deal Brexit in December, right? Uh, and I think that will be interesting for Switzerland in, in a way because I think it will focus sort of minds also on what actually happens, but perhaps also on what does not happen, right? I mean, I think. Uh, I mean, I've showed you that the um, that uh, the Brexit chaos had a deterring effect, but there, some evidence that we have also shows that Johnson's deal uh, sort of then had an encouraging effect on being much more sort of uh, like you know uh, increasing uh, support for more um, non-cooperative outcomes in Switzerland as well. So I think Brexit will be closely watched. I think uh, it will be interesting to see what, what the UK uh, negotiates with the EU, but then you also have to see the, the UK is, of course, a much, much bigger economy than Switzerland. So it's not going to be so easy to just one on one take what the UK has negotiated and apply it to Switzerland. I mean, the UK is currently trying to do that with the, the, the Canadian deal, right? The CETA deal and sort of saying, well, but you negotiated this, we're also going to take that. But of course, Canada is much further away. It's a much smaller trading partner, level playing field uh, considerations are m much less of an issue there. So you can see how, you know, it's, it's not going to be so easy. And ultimately, and I think that's something that's important to keep in mind, international cooperation is, is not something that anyone imposes on countries. It's something that sovereign states decide to do. So, you know, nobody can force Switzerland into a treaty, but no one can force the EU into a treaty either. And in the end, then, in terms of bargaining power, we have to think who's the stronger partner in the end. And there has to be some realism, I think. And it could be that there's going to be some period where the, you know, where the status quo sort of deteriorates because there's no updates uh, in the bilateral relations anymore. And then at some point, maybe there is something. But I think, as Krista Markwala pointed out, there is a risk then that we're not going back to square zero, but zero minus one. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Stephanie Walter, Frank uh, Schimmelfennig. Uh, you uh, have the final remarks. Uh, bargaining power was mentioned. Has the bargaining power of the EU maybe decreased uh, in the course of this pandemic? Or is this also one of these illusions uh, uh, that uh, some people might have? I think it's uh, uh, it's one of the illusions. There has been uh, a lot of talk about uh, the unraveling of the EU during the financial crisis, uh, the migration crisis. It's going to continue. It's it's part of the discourse. Um, but I think um, uh, it's also clear that muddling through is really always the best prediction yeah, for how the EU evolves. And I think muddling through is also the best prediction for how EU-Swiss relations will revolve. And I think um, uh, the uh, Brexit actually becomes less and less important for this relationship because it seems to be clear now that the UK will be in a very different orbit uh, uh, than um, Switzerland. It will probably be much less integrated than uh, Switzerland already is now. And I think the um, uh, the discussions will not be really comparable. Yeah. So I think um, 
um, Switzerland will have to decide on its on its own where it wants to be and looking towards the UK will probably not be the most important part of this deal. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. We almost finished in time uh, on time. Uh, uh, with that, I would like to uh, conclude um, this debate. Thank you so much uh, to the four panelists for these uh, interesting insights, uh, data, opinions, and thank you all much uh, for to all of you in the audience for this in for engaging in this debate for participating. Uh, thank you so much to, uh, to TEPSA for organizing it. Uh, goodbye, stay safe, and have a nice rest of your day, wherever you are. Thank you.